Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm wearing my hair down today and I don't care. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Once Upon a Time in the West, released in 1968 from writers Sergio Donati, Dario Argento, Sergio Leone and Bernardo Bertolucci. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows Harmonica, played by Charles Bronson, who's just turned up in a small town seeking revenge on Frank, played by Henry Fonda. Frank and his gang have just killed the McBains at a small farm ranch so that they can steal the land, but they haven't taken into account Jill McBain, played by Claudia Cardinale. He also hasn't taken into account Cheyenne, the leader of the gang, played by Jason Robards, who's a little bit upset that Frank has used his gang to kill this family. As the four of them get together, we wonder which one of them will draw first and fall dead. So this Sergei Leone movie came out after his well, pretty much acclaimed Spaghetti Western trilogy with yeah. Clint Eastwood. Yeah. And he was pretty much done and dusted with this genre. He didn't want to make any more Westerns. Yeah, yeah. And he wanted to go to America and make make some more movies. Uh, but then Paramount Studios turned around and went, eh, how about uh, before you get to make Once Upon a Time in America, mm. which I know you want to make, yeah. make another Western. And uh, we'll... we'll uh, We'll, uh, we'll give you this massive budget to do it. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. He went away and wrote the script with everybody else. He studied other westerns. And, yeah. And then he was like, hmm, okay, I'll get Clint Eastwood back. And Clint was like, no, nah, I'm done doing that. Yeah, I'm done, done. Yeah. So he was like, okay, well, uh, I also want to get hold of Henry Fonda to mm. play the villain. Yeah. And Henry Fonda went, no, nah, I'm not doing that either. I'm a good guy. Exactly. I'm not a villain. So Sergio Leone apparently got on a plane and flew all the way over to the States to meet with Henry and yeah. go, look, this is the role. This is what I want you for. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, he signed on. And then, apparently, uh, Fonda flew over to Italy, got some contact lenses put in, yeah. grew out a beard. And when he turned up on set, Sergio was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Out with the context, off <laughs> yeah. with that. We, we want this big reveal, which comes early on in the movie, yeah. where you just mentioned in the synopsis uh, that there's a massacre at the farm. And the big reveal, that Henry Fonda, who's known as a good guy, yeah. was this butcher this really cold-hearted killer kid killer exactly so i was like and, and all of that i mean just where do you even begin with this movie oh, you know it's yeah. it's gone down as one of the greatest westerns of all time and it was also one of those movies that was shown in in film in mm. media classes yeah, yeah. Uh, as an introduction to this genre as well and this film has always stayed with me i've always revisited it every 10 years or mm. so yeah and I, i'm still like still spellbound by the mastery at work in this film it, it really is yeah i mean as i've gotten older i've really started to really appreciate westerns like when i was young i never got them they were old movies you know and i, I kind of understand people's views of oh i don't want to go too far back in history and watch black and white movies or things like that because i used to be like that you know i wanted to just watch sci-fis and horrors and people get cut and cut up and all that kind of stuff but at some point I needed to get out of those genres. I was kind of bored. You know, movies at that caliber kind of dissolved and not been very good. And so I started to watch westerns, you know, uh, a, a fistful of dynamite, a fistful of dollars, you know, the Magnificent Seven, you know, Once Upon a Time, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. And then as I got older and older, I started to really go and watch, you know, stranger ones like support your local sheriff and sure. 310 to Yuma as well the I, original yeah i agree for me it was films like unforgiven yeah and tombstone that were my gateways into the genre yeah yeah and then once you've seen those you're like okay how did we get here yeah and you go back and then you realize that you know maybe unforgiven is one of the best but there were some bests before that too yeah i know like i said going back to even the classic black and whites where you're seeing those stuntmen fall off High the real horses and things like that like there is a there is a skill in westerns, classic westerns, that you don't really see anymore because health and safety, for one. You know, special effects are easier to do. But Sergio Leone is that name. Whenever you think of westerns, Sergio Leone is the first name that pops up. And it always does make me laugh. The first one he did with Clint, A Fistful of Dollars, well, that's just a remake of Yojimbo. Right. Which, he, which he kind of got sued for. Oh. <laughs> you know, Magnificent Seven is just a remake of Seven Samurai. So 
when I first watched The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, it was so original, it was so new, there was no story like it, and there was these, just, these beautiful vistas, this open land, these great wide shots. The first time I ever watched Once Upon a Time in the West, I gotta admit, I was naive. I thought it was slow, I thought it was boring, there just wasn't enough action. Not like, not like The Good Man, The Ugly, that's got bridges blowing up and people being hanged and big shootouts. But watching this for the review, this has got, you know, a, such a core story of four people. You know, they're well, just the main <clears throat> stars. There, there are hundreds of actors in this movie, but that's so it. it's just it, four it's, core. It's Jill McBain who is actually the star of the mm, movie and yeah. the, the lead character. And it was something that Sergio Leone was also a bit hesitant about because this is the only movie where he has a woman as the main star, the main, yeah. the main actor. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he was very hesitant about it, but one of the other writers was like, no, do it this way. It's going to be different. It'll be unique that way as well. Yeah. And of course, we don't actually get introduced to Jill until about 15, 20 minutes into the film. <laughs> Yeah, because we have one of the greatest cinematic in intros to a movie of all time. Oh yeah. <laughs> this opening at this train station where three guys just turn up in their their duster jackets. Yeah. You know, they barely say a word. But they are menacing mm -hmm. and intimidating. Yeah. And they bully this clerk into the back room. Yeah. They lock him in there and then they just loiter oh. and wait. And we wait with them for more than 10 minutes. Yeah. And there's no music here. No, now, originally, Ennio Morricone's score was actually, curiously, Ennio Morricone's score was written before the film was made. And usually the score is done mm. after the film. Yeah, yeah. But they... He wanted to shoot the film and then edit the film to the music as well. Yeah. So, but the music he had wasn't working here. So he's like, I'm going to drop all the music. And I think it actually works to I, this film's benefit because yeah. that, that sound effect of that creaking metal. Yeah. You know? And then the sound of that fly the buzzing. The fly, yeah. Uh, of the, um, the telegram machine clicking. The water dripping the on water the water dripping. Hat. It all builds that tension and that suspense because... We know these guys are up to no good, but what <laughs> yeah. and why? Yeah, you know, and and the way it builds. I mean, the way they put they they smother jam over his face to get the fly there, you know, and then he traps it in the gun barrel and he's just listening to it. Like these these are clearly bad guys, but yeah. you're still interested in them. And so even though there's no dialogue, you're getting enthralled yeah. into this world. And then the train arrives. Like, tell me another film that has a ten minute intro before it even kicks off. Right. You know, I used to, I used, like I said, I used to think that this opening was slow. I thought it was boring. I didn't know what the fuck I was talking about. I'm sat here, I'm sat watching it for the review. I'm in the mood. I mean, maybe it's, I play too much Red Dead Redemption, but I'm sat there and I'm like, man, this is like a rock star opening. You know, the credits coming up. You know there's a train coming, but when is it coming? When are you going to start to hear that sound? And then when it finally turns up, the three guys are all prepared. They've got their guns ready. Whoever they're supposed to meet at this train, they're going to kill. Or hoping to kill. And then Charles Bronson kind of just appears on the other side of the train, doesn't he? The As train the train's leaving. Off, yeah. And he's just there. And harmonica in mouth, and you're hearing the music kick in yeah. at that point, and you're not actually aware that he's the one playing he's the playing harmonica because yeah. you feel like it's the music score now just coming in. Yeah, which it also is, is. a massive part of the music score yeah. as well. Uh, Ennio Morricone's score in this is absolutely fantastic, and every character that gets out of them, all the main characters have their own themes, mm. which develop and change throughout the movie, and they get super layered. And, of course, some characters, their themes actually overlap as well, which signifies the characters kind of overlapping. Yeah. Uh, it, it's masterfully done here. And, yeah, we know I mean, uh, this dialogue. It just goes to show how much of a badass harmonica is. Oh, yeah. He's, he shakes his head at first and he goes, no, you brought two horses too many. Yeah. And the shock on the other guy's face, like he's just been slapped as he realizes this guy is... <laughs> See, I was a little slightly confused at this point because it's they know he's coming. Frank has sent them here. We don't know that yet, but we yeah. Well, no, he say he says that they say that they're like oh Frank yeah, yeah. has sent us. So yeah. I'm like so so whoever Frank is, he knew that this guy was turning up, or he wanted these guys waiting for whichever whatever the stranger was who was going to step off, and it just so happens to be harmonica. 
But then when they pulled their gun, I mean, I've seen enough Westerns. They weren't pulling fast enough on this guy. And friggin' Charles Bronson goes, blam, 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 and just takes them all out. But funnily enough, he gets injured and gets taken out. So for me, I'm like, man, it's like a beginning of a game. You know, like somebody's going to help him in a minute and they're going to heal him up. And then he's going to, nope. He just kind of gets up, checks his arm and, and he, he, he disappears off. Yeah. And then we, we cut to, to this father out with his son. You know, they're hunting kind of quails, I think it is. And they grab the, the birds and um, they rush back to their farmhouse. Beautiful little farmhouse out in this little desert place. And their 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 mum has died, I think, what, you know, six years, I think it was. That's said, right, yeah. Six years previously. And this dad is just raising his daughter, his oldest son and his youngest son all together on this farm. Um, and he's telling his oldest son, you've got to go and you've got to meet this woman from the train station and bring her back here. We're going to have a party. You know, he, he's he's in charge. It's the old West. He's the, he's the man of the house, you know, so he'll tell him everything. And uh, his daughter's there and he says to her, like, I'm just going to go get some fresh water. And he walks over and there's a gunshot. And like, I, 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 I not felt this the first two times i watched this but when he turns and you watch his daughter hit the floor i'm like oh shit like Maureen, there's, yeah there's not many westerns that kill kids that's true you know and then dad's shot yeah the oldest son shot and the little kid comes running out this little boy comes running out and you watch that beautiful shot where all the guys and dusters kind of just start emerge out of the bush. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. <laughs> now I also just want to say there was uh, some awesome soundscape here as well. The foreshadowing of something ominous happening. Oh yeah, the as crickets. All the crickets just went silent. Yes. Just before the murders happened, and yeah, this is what we were talking about earlier with the reveal of Henry Fonda stepping out as Frank, yeah. just standing there, just you know, <laughs> after this this massacre, and somebody goes, "What are we going to do with them now, Frank?" And he just pulls out his gun. He goes, well, now that you've uh, used my name. Yeah. And he just grins. Where he just starts to smile as the gun is aimed at the kid. And you hear the shot. And we cut to the train. Yeah. It's like, brutal. 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 And you, you then set up with uh, Claudia Cardinale playing Jill McBain stepping off the train and so she's the woman who was supposed to be picked up by the boy you know it's really really sad it is even though her theme oh. tune is beautiful you you've just witnessed her new family murdered yeah and she's wandering around waiting for the somebody to pick her up, pick and her up. she's yeah. looking around and again the cinematography is outstanding oh. the set design the is set amazing design. and uh, she ends up wondering and oh this is the overhead shot where it comes up over and reveals oh, the whole flagstone town. town oh yeah and uh, eventually armadillo she, fucking armadillo oh, right <laughs> <laughs> and she eventually uh hires someone uh, to take her out to sweetwater yeah uh, where where her her new home's going to be yeah and we get the fun ride as the guy's galloping through yeah you know, going super fast and we get this again these sweeping shots of these vistas uh before they eventually get to the farm well they, they stop at that post first don't they that's right they, yeah they stop at this kind of watering hole so that they can pick up some supplies and stuff and she walks in and she has uh she has the 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 kind of meeting first with harmonica but then we get introduced to cheyenne played by jason robards who's a classic actor i remember him as the dad from parenthood you know he's just that you know, well, he's also in Philadelphia. He's just a, the older he got, the kind of yeah. more hardcore he got in his position. <laughs> he's my favorite character in this film, and his introduction is the best. I mean, the other ones have cool cinematic introductions, but his is is a farce. Is it's it? a cartoon. When when they're in there, because we don't see what's going no, on. We all don't. we hear is all these gunshots yeah. and people going, Ugh, yeah, yeah. but it's like there's all these like chong, chong, yeah. you know, ricochet gunshots, and we're cutting to people shaving, cleaning their legs, the old lady waking up from her sleep. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's it's cartoonish in its presentation compared to what we just witnessed. Yeah. And then when he does stumble in or he walks in backwards, yeah. And we're like, who is this man? What what just went on outside? We don't know. No. But he seems like a dangerous person, the way that he holds the entire room's attention. Yeah. And we don't realize, it's again, expertly crafted, where when he raises the drink, we see the cuffs. Yeah. And like, he's yeah. an outlaw who's yeah. just broken free. Yeah, yeah. The way then that he goes up to harmonica, and he just holds everyone's attention, just like, 
can't trust this person. But the music, though, mm. again, is very light and playful. Yeah, yeah. And that pretty much encapsulates who this character will be, is that, yeah, he's an outlaw, he's done some terrible things, but as the film goes on, we realise he's actually pretty much got a heart of gold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with the, with the three characters, with Harmonica, Cheyenne and Frank, it, it felt, again, like the good, the bad and the ugly. Harmonica is the good, Cheyenne is the ugly uh, and, and Frank is the bad, but different to what the good, the bad and the ugly is, you know, they, they're all... They've all got their stories intertwined. And I, I liked in the notes where it was saying, like, um, we read um, that Sergio Leone, had, like I said, he didn't want to make any more Westerns. But then they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, come on. We'll, we'll give you the money and we'll give you Henry Fonda. So go off and have a think about it. And so he went off and he just sat there for a year watching classic Westerns with Dario Argento and the director of friggin' Last Tango in Paris. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for that year while they just sat there going, that sequence is good. We, we should try to replicate that. And that sequence is, is great. I like, I make fun of it, but I know that Sergio Leone, like he was paying homage to these movies that he'd probably grown up with and he loved as well. So he wanted oh, yeah. to play it back. So there are things in the movie where you go, oh, I've seen that before and I know where that's coming. But then with, his twist on it, it feels really unique. And so then, yeah, Jill McBain, she leaves with the wagon guy and they head back uh, to the McBain ranch. And that's when they come across this funeral procession. And you've got the family laid out on the table. And she's really upset, especially because the little boy has died. She, Claudia Cardinale's kind of acting made me think that she wanted to be a mum. Yeah. And she'd not had the chance, but this was going to be her chance. She was going to try to help raise this child, this family. They were going to do some cool things or whatever. And yeah. Well, we find out as well that she'd actually married McBain back in New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a month, while ago. A month before. So yeah. Was, so yeah, that's so she came here to to have a new life, and she was also told that McBain was a wealthy person. And uh, and of course everyone else jokes that you know McBain causes this territory uh, sweet water, yeah. but it's just sand and dirt yeah. and a well, yeah. you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. uh, but we'll find out later that McBain kind of knew that a railroad was going to come across his territory at some point. Yeah, because we keep seeing that in the background. That's right. Yeah, the film drops that at the beginning. Of course, we see we started a station as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we also then follow Jill in the house by herself, and she's going through all the drawers and the cupboards, and she's trying to find this wealth that yeah. apparently was there. And obviously, she doesn't find it. And she is then almost determined or resolute in the fact that she's just going to go back to where she came from. And yeah, yeah. Her, her life, you know, she's left was pretty bad, but she can't imagine trying to survive out here on her own, trying to deal with all this. Especially when, you know, there's a weird man with a harmonica <laughs> on her land yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. And and the, the, the intricacies of the story is so deep because, you know, like I'm sure I've seen a few things with Henry Fonda in, but I never really caught how good of an actor he was until i saw him in this playing the villain you know and he's he's talking to this kind of rich uh land owner train owner whatever oh, yeah they call him the train baron the train baron played uh called morton um and he's suffering from uh some kind of debilitating illness which is you know affecting his bones affecting yeah. his bones so he's having to use crutches to move around and he wants to control the railroad morton's pretty much the film's main villain yeah but He's also very sympathetic because of that, you know, debilitating yeah. disease and the fact that he is, you know, restricted to being in this train. He disagreed with Frank killing and massacring the whole family. He just wanted to. He just wanted Frank to scare them off the land. Yeah, but for Henry Fonda's work, but they look pretty scared to me. Yeah, you know, you're like, oh man, that's that that's harsh, and it it reflects to how I feel about Charles Bronson's character, like. I know Charles Bronson is a good actor. You know, he's been in some classics, but I've never, ever felt that he really had range. You know, a lot of his performances are kind of the same. It's Charles Bronson kind of staring at you with a gun, you know? <laughs> you're, you're dead. You're, you're basically dead. Dirty Dozen, Magnificent Seven, this, Death Wish. There's, there's not really much range. Where in contrast to Frank, Henry Fonda, we could probably get... 10 of his roles where he's a cool, helpful kind of guy. And then you've got this where he's a fucking 
past tense. It really is. <laughs> and I love how just reserved he is in just the way that he talks, the way that he carries himself, the way yeah. that he moves. Yeah. He looks and acts dangerous. Yeah. He is... Honestly, I think it's literally a masterclass on how to play a villain. And considering he had a career playing good guys, it's like, how did he do that so well? Yeah, well, it's that's incredible. It, that's it. <laughs> I mean, I I kind of feel Lee Van Cleef is still tipping yeah. it as as a big villain. But then it's, again, Lee Van Cleef is a bit like Charles Bronson. He only plays kind of yeah. you know villainy characters. It's Henry just Fonda. It's from thinking of like uh, Robin Williams in One Hour Photo. You oh, know, where you're just yes. like, such a lovable guy, and then yeah. Jesus, Jesus scary. Christ, how do they do that? And it comes out that Cheyenne is the leader of a gang of outlaws as well, who all wear dusters, long duster coats. And so the three guys that were killed at the train station were part of his gang. The bunch of guys that killed the McBains were part of his gang. So Cheyenne is being kind of forced out of the deal that Frank is making with Morton because Frank, Frank doesn't want to be an outlaw really anymore. He kind of wants to be a businessman. Yeah. But he can't because his business always ends on the end of a gun. And he's usually the one holding it compared to the person. And so Harmonica then kind of, you know, cause he, he's looking for Frank. He's wanting to get revenge on Frank. We don't know why. We and yeah. we see flashbacks every, oh. every now and then, but yeah. they're kind of blurred. So mm. we don't really know. But the film's letting us know there's something and it won't and it will wait until the right moment to tell us. Yeah, and we don't even really know his real name. Every time he interacts with Frank and Frank's like, who are you and what are you doing here? Harmonica just keeps telling him names, but they're names of dead men. Yeah. You know, even, ones that Frank has killed. Yeah, ones that Frank has killed. And so Frank's like, I'm going to find out who you are. But Harmonica realizes that Jill's onto something, you know, and so he starts to look into the background. And, and it's when Jill kind of, I, I think it's before the auction that she finds out that McBain had the delivery of all this wood and all these nails and all this stuff. Like he was going to build a small town yeah, somewhere. Because all she found when she was looking for the wealth was all these little miniature models. Yeah. With the station and stuff. And she yeah. just thought how quaint, but cheap really. Yeah. And so yeah, once all that stuff was there, she realized that's where the wealth was going to come from. So they were going to build a small town out here because there was no fresh water for, what, 50 miles in any yeah, direction. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, she is though captured essentially by Frank. And yeah. Well, I mean, she's, pre she's essentially she's, raped by him. Yeah, yeah. And then he, he teased about killing her afterwards. Yeah. But then he has the bright idea to then take her to the auction to sell it. And he fills that entire room with his own goons. Yeah. So that anybody tried to bid high, they would get shut down. Well, come on, my friends. $200. The livestock alone is worth twice that much. And they're in the auction room, yeah. And people start to bid and somebody leans over and whispers something nasty in their mouth. And then another guy is just kind of lazily on the chair, just raising his hand at the tiniest little price. And this is where Cheyenne and, and Harmonica have kind of come to terms that they know Frank is being a bad guy. And he's using Cheyenne's gang and trying to blame Cheyenne for all the killings so that he goes to jail. So he's got a wanted poster of his face. $5,000. And Harmonica goes, 5,000! And everyone's looks shocked. And he walks down and he's like, as soon as I take Cheyenne in, I'll get 5,000 and then I'll be able to buy the land. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> Brilliant. I just want to bring a bit of trivia here for you. Okay, well, yeah. Is that um, uh, Claudia Cardinale's first day of filming mm. was the nude scene, essentially, with uh, Fonda. Right, right, yeah. And uh, so I was like, that's a wonderful first day of the, <laughs> the shoot, bet, isn't it? I bet you he was really nice, though. Right. Yeah, but Henry Fonda's wife flew out to, for the filming of this scene. I bet you he was really, really <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, I'm sitting here <laughs> while you film this sequence. So, oh, yeah, Henry Fonda was being watched. Uh, no, no naughtiness. <laughs> You also like to feel a man's hands all over you. Mm. You like it. But yeah, you know, he, they, they have that little sequence, don't they? Frank and Harmonica in the in the kind of bar. And he just keeps repeating these dead man's names. And you can tell that Frank is kind of getting a little bit annoyed by this. But he's also a little bit nervous to draw his gun because this guy knows him and he's ready for him. So... This guy could kill him. Yeah. And because Frank's 
upset Morton. You know, he's pushed him around, he's bullied him. We're coming back to Morton and Morton's just paying Frank's guys $500. Like, look, you know, I'm just saying that if you help me take out Frank, there'll be more money for you. And so they all decide, oh yeah, okay, we're going to go kill Frank. And you get that awesome sequence in the town. I mean, Cheyenne has been led off by the cops at this point, And he's like, whoa, I'm going to the town jail. And they're like, no, 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 we're putting you on the train. And we're going to send you to this place because they've got a bigger jail. And they can hold you for longer. And so Cheyenne's a bit like, hang on a minute, what? <laughs> no, what? Yeah. And two of his gang members decide to follow him onto the train. The rest of the gang, they, they're dotted around the town. And Harmonica is just watching Frank. He tells him, like, you know. If I was more, I'd have you killed. Right. And he's with uh, Jill, who's having a, a, a bubble bath, yeah. <laughs> which soon turns into a blood bath. <laughs> As the hitmen, I guess, are start trying to take out Frank, but Frank becomes aware of them. Yeah. And on top of that, Harmonica becomes his guardian angel. He does, yeah. And tells them, like, oh, like, yeah, he points out the clock. Obviously, there's lots of images of unfinished clocks yeah. uh, in the film, which, of course, is a play on the film's title as well, Once Upon a Time. Yeah. And, uh, and he, he keeps helping Frank, pointing out where all these other shooters are. And Frank manages to get away. And you're like, Harmonica wants revenge on him. But I guess it's personal. He oh, wants to do it himself. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. That's immediately what comes across. Yeah. I mean, Jill's even annoyed. She's like, why'd you let him live? Right. Why'd you let him go? And Harmonica doesn't need to explain to him. But you're, you you do get the feeling from the movie that he wants to do it himself. Yeah. He's going he's gonna to wait. And, and so Frank heads all the way back to Morton. And I said to the Gary before we turned the camera on, I got a little bit confused by this bit because we'd seen Cheyenne go off. And we'd seen the two guys get on the train and then the big shootout and then Frank's gone to Morton. But when we get back to Morton's train, there's a load of gang members that have been killed there. You know, we don't know by who, we don't know what happened. We just know that people have just been blasted and he finds Morton outside kind of wounded. Yeah. Dying. Yeah. yeah. And he, he doesn't even kill him. No, he saw it where he realizes he's already done for and yeah. just lets him suffer, I guess. Yeah. And it's kind of sad. Like, even though Morton is the one who set everything in motion, you know, by hiring Frank to do the to scaring, which became the killing, which obviously didn't go the way he planned it to yeah. be. Um, but it's the fact that he was the one who wanted to get the rail all the way over to the west so he could see the Pacific. Yeah. And... There was that wonderful moment where he's staring at his painting and you mm. think you can hear the ocean, but I think it's actually just the train <laughs> making those noises. Yeah. And the fact that he's just there, like, over a muddy puddle, and that's as close he's going to get to the Pacific. Oh, man, I just remember we missed the bit where... We missed the whole train sequence. With the train yeah, sequence. Yeah. Oh, man, I, that's <laughs> such a great sequence. Because uh, Harmonica goes after Frank, follows Frank, gets onto the train, yeah. gets the pistol in the face and gets captured. He gets slapped around a yeah. bit, and that's where he repeats all of the dead names which upsets and annoys frank because frank's like who are you for real why are you hounding me yeah but then uh when we think well, harmonica's done for we realize that cheyenne is hiding underneath the train, train and he does this whole thing where he ends up sneaking on top of the train as the uh, the other store owner gets shot and killed and uh he taps on the glass to confuse the other guy yeah. and then he holds the boot down off the train and the other guy's like, oh gonna get him gonna get him and the gunshot goes off through the boot it's just all these oh, little so great, great moments yeah yeah, yeah it's good <laughs> but like i said everything's coming to a head and, and harmonica gets back to sweetwater and sees all the stuff there and he he breaks down the entire kind of plot to Cheyenne and for the audience as well while he's trying to set up the stakes you know he explains to Cheyenne like look McBain knew that the train would have to come through here there's no water for miles other than those wells and so that's what they're going to need to keep the train track going if they can do that they can build a town here they can build a station before you know it there's going to just be people here the train's going to come through there's going to be money and it's all going to be on this land which is literally owned by jill at the moment and cheyenne i love that bit where cheyenne just turns to his men and he's just like well what are you all waiting for get it together here's all this stuff and the guys are like oh, what we, we how know. do we do that <laughs> how do we do that and he just yeah he, he forces them all to to make the uh to build the town when we when we come back to the town like every, you got all those guys there. They're building the track. They're, they're, they're getting everything ready. Harmonica is just kind of sat there, just chilling, just doing his thing. And here comes Frank. I, my God, this was the sequence that made me go. You know what, Ian? You were wrong. You didn't know what you were talking about ten years ago. 
this moment between Charles Bronson and Henry Fonda, it's so tight. It's electric. <laughs> oh, the way he kind of climbs down and reaches for his gun and Frank reaches for his, but Bronson kind of turns his gun so he's holding the barrel and to slips it in and they just kind of signal they're going to go over to place because they're finally going to have their confrontation. And, and unlike The Good, The Bad and The Ugly where there's this big music build up and there's you've been waiting throughout the whole movie for those these two, three guys to get together. In this... There's not really much of a build-up. The workers are still working. Jill's in her house, kind of getting stuff together. Cheyenne's in the house as well, kind of having a shave and saying to her, like, you should take some water out to the workers. You, they're, they're doing all this work. A beautiful woman, and which she is. Oh, yeah. She Hell is yeah. absolutely, like, the diamond in the hole of the rough of this desert. If they slap your ass... Don't worry about it. Just go with it because it's just... They've earned it. They've That's earned it. Says. You know, which I'm like, well, okay, yeah, he's got to go it was, a, it was a sign of the times. You yeah, know? Fair, yeah, the old West. Um, but yeah, we're watching Frank and Harmonica. You say there's no music. I think the music here is spellbinding. Like, because this is where Frank's theme and Harmonica's theme is overlapping and yeah. echoing and building and, and the way that it's cut to the music as well. And the and the the, the cinematography, oh, the the yeah. shot composition of yeah. them, the extreme slow close up onto his face, yeah. the way the camera's just panning around him as they're circling each other, it's absolutely cinematic brilliance. Yeah, <laughs> and then they cut to the flashback, which I, I like. I I totally forgot, you know. But just going back to this flashback of you see a a kind of more worn Frank, more dirtier Frank. You know, and he pulls out this harmonica and he walks to this small boy and he shoves the harmonica in his mouth and he's like, you take care of your brother. Keep your loving brother happy. And we, we, we kind of pull back of this boy with this harmonica in his mouth with this man's feet on his shoulders and you realize that this boy is trying to hold up his brother who's got a rope around his neck and frank and his three guys are just kind of watching and you're like oh my god this is what set this all off yeah you know how long has harmonica been training and getting himself ready to find you know how how far has he gone what has he done who has he seen who has he killed just to find frank's location and he the, the boy falls into the dust and you you kind of hear the ding ding of the bell because the rope's pulled and the harmonica music is still kind of playing and it cuts back and it kind of dawns on frank who this is and then they draw and it's over in a matter of seconds as frank spins around and we see the bullet wound he tries to holster his gun and drops it yeah. falls down and harmonica just Puts the harmonica in Frank's mouth. Yeah. And we see the realization in his eyes as he goes down. And again, the music just accompanies the actual harmonica sound yeah. as he hits the dirt. It's awesome. Oh, it's awesome. It is. Freaking awesome. Yeah. And then, you know, Jill kind of is still in the house with Cheyenne. And Cheyenne kind of, he's, he's the voice of wisdom in a few sequences. Absolutely, yeah. You know, where he kind of explains to her, like, look, I can't stay. I got to go. And she's kind of happy with that. And he says to her, and he can't stay either. He doesn't know which one of them survived. He's pretty sure it's harmonica, but he's not entirely sure. And he and he's just like, he's not going to stay with you. He doesn't love you. You just you just got to get that idea in your head. And harmonica comes in and literally says like, I can't stay. And Jill's shocked. Like, maybe what? you'll come visit someday. Yeah, someday. someday. And off he goes. It's like, damn. Him and Cheyenne, they, they, they leave together. Cheyenne, you know, gets his stuff together and gives her a little slap on the ass as he walks out. It's just so cool. <laughs> and then they get on the horse and they're kind of told enough. But Cheyenne falls off, lands on the floor, and he reveals he's got a bullet wound. And he's just like, look, don't look at me while I die. And I'm like, oh, my God, Jason Robards. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so cool, man. I mean, you know Eli Wallach. But man, there's that, that, that sequence where he's just he's just slow breathing and harmonica kind of turns away and then when he turns back he's slumped over. Yeah. And I think he he puts him on the horse. He does on the other him, horse and takes him with him. Takes yeah. him with him. Beautiful. Yeah. And that's when the film title drops. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't drop normally, it kind of swirls, swirls around. around. Yeah. yeah. I was sat there like, 
Did this come up at the beginning of the film? I can't Didn't, remember. No, no. Oh. no, we had 10 minutes of, of credits, yes, but no yeah, film title. No film title. Yeah. Peculiar. The weird thing is, with the end of the film, like, normally I'd kind of be afraid this is this is a woman on her own, out in the desert, with all these workers, with all these men. We've seen all this horrible shit that can happen. So, like, is this really a good ending? But... The she fact that the train she... turns up, it feels like civilization's got here. Yeah. And the bad has been, you know, removed. And she feels stronger. Yeah. She was already strong, but she feels stronger to be able to turn to each of these guys and be like, here's your drink, drink your water, do your work. We can work together. We can get this done. Or I'll kill you because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do. Right. <laughs> well, Liam, what were your favourite scenes? Oh, man. Like, how... How do you how do you even start? Where do you start? What do you pick? Like this normally normally I'd complain a three hour movie is just kind of too much. It can build up too much. But I knew how long this movie was, so I took it in little drabs. I didn't have three hours. I barely had two, so I had to like get it. But moments are the beginning sequence, that ten minute sequence, it's it's beautifully made, it's beautifully shot. The way the sun is, the desert. I mean, I know they're not they're not in Texas or Mexico. They're well, in Spain. <clears throat> there's actually they filmed a couple of things in America. Actually, right, just right. To, I get the authenticity, I suppose. Yeah, uh, but yeah, the rest of it was shot in in Spain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it just it it's, it looks sandy. It looks hot. You've got these three guys just waiting, you know, and then Charles Bronson appears, and you you just know from the way that Sergio Leone has situated the guys into position. And, and and got them all set up in this this one camera shot. Somebody's gonna get fucking shot and blam blam blam. <laughs> the music that plays when uh, Jill's waiting at the station, like you said, after we've just seen the McBain family killed, and then you know by the, at the same time when she gets the farm it's it's so beautiful you feel the loss before she's even felt the loss it's Anil Maricone oh you bastard <laughs> you bastard you know you can just hit certain frequencies with your music that just make you go oh Christ I know what's going on and the character doesn't know what's going on Oh, it's amazing. I mean, there are so many great shots I could go on for hours and I don't want to, but I'll make it easy for myself. After that, it's, it's the shot with Frank uh, and Harmonica walking to the back of the house. Yeah. Preparation for their death duel. And then on top of that, the flashback to show you w what Harmonica has been through to bring him towards Frank's door. Oh, yeah. And, and Shiny, he's just fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, favourite scenes in this film is really hard because from start to finish, it's a near masterpiece. Uh, so I guess I'm just going with kind of personal preference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but of course, we've mentioned it multiple times. That first 10 minutes is exquisitely <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, so that entire, entire sequence, that whole scene is magnificent. Love it. I love Cheyenne's intro. You know, there's the sound effects, the wacky noises as he ends up backing into this, this bar. Uh, it was great. And then all of his introduction scene as well. Brilliant. Absolutely well done. Yeah. Uh, I also love Harmonica's introduction as well in that sequence when Cheyenne comes in. The way that he throws the light across yeah. the ceiling yeah. and the way that the light just keeps you know, uh, shining on Harmonica's face and kind of blanking out his eyes. It's like it's just perfect every time. Like every shot. Every shot is almost like a painting. Yeah. It's so good. The reveal of Flagstone when the camera pans all the way up from behind the train or behind the station and we just see this wonderful set. All these extras oh, in yeah. costumes as well. It's like... This is really, really well done. Yes. Also, something else I want to bring up is, I mean, we've mentioned how good everything else is, but also the script and the dialogue is fantastic. And there's so many great one-liners, like, um, when you've killed four, it's easy to make it five. Yes. It's like, damn, like, yeah. <laughs> the sequence where, uh, where he's talking about the horses earlier on as well. Looks like we're shy of one horse. You brought two too many. Uh, again, when uh, when uh, Cheyenne is dying and he's just like, pray, you know, when you find someone who's going to take you out, that they know where to shoot. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like that. Now, interestingly as well, like um, when when Harmonica turns around from that moment, mm. there's literally a bullet hole square in his back. I'm like, really? was that there at the beginning of the film? Did he... 
shoot somebody? Did he take it from somebody who died? Or was at one point Harmonica shot in the back and died? And he's a specter this whole time. And then that made me think, well, Frank, we've seen him kill kids. Why did he let Harmonica go when he was a kid? Who knew who he was, saw his face. Like, did his MO change from then to now? Possibly. Did he kill that boy with the harmonica at the beginning? And he's now, now that he's done another kid killing, did the specter of this thing, like, come after him? Mm. I don't know. There's some, and of course, with the bullet wound that he took at the beginning as well, and the fact that he seems to heal pretty quickly, there's a, I wouldn't say supernatural. Like, it, it, no, see, yeah. like it, it's like, it's just going off way beyond what the film is. Maybe. I'm reading too much into it, I think. Well, no, no, no. Because at the same time, like I said, you know, we, we know for a fact Leone. Uh, you know, sat with two of his mates and just watched a shit ton of westerns, and you know, and he took notes from all of it. So you you could be right, you know, from a certain aspect. They harmonica, talk about harmonica and death quite yeah, a lot as yeah, well. Harmonica could, could be, you know, a, a version of the ghost coming back to seek revenge on Frank, you know, and that just plays into the fancy of the idea. We don't know much about harmonica's history, and we don't even know where he goes from this. It's literally. This is his moment to come in and make a difference and take Frank down, you know. Mm. So it's like, where did Sergio Leone really come up with the idea of Frank? Or is he just taking little bits from different films to say, yeah. I'm now I've made this Frankenstein type character who just goes off into the sunset like we always thought they would. Right, right. Yeah. Well, Ian, do you recommend Once Upon a Time in the West? I Hell of a do, you know, if you've even considered playing Red Dead Redemption or Red Dead Redemption 2, you really need to do yourself justice and and the game justice by going back and watching classic westerns like this. I know, I know a lot of people will be like, well, I think Sergio Leone is a hack and he stole ideas from this and everything. Well, that's just the nature of the business. That's just cinema. That's just game making. You know, people do it from all over the place. He did... I think hit his peak with the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think he knew that as well and was like, look, I, I'm, I'm done. I want to do something else. I want to do Once Upon a Time in America. But they turned around, the company turned around to him and went, no, 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 here's a shit ton of money. Here's Henry Fonda. Let's see what you can do. And for some people, this might be too much. It might be too slow. They might not get it. But as you get older, there'll be a point where you go, hmm, I feel like an old man. I want to sit down and watch a Western. You can't go wrong with this one. I, I will admit, I'll be honest, it's not in my top five. It certainly is in my top ten. It certainly is one of those movies that you know Quentin Tarantino watched and went, I want to make a western. And he took ideas and, and, and threw it together. But like like my friend here said, the music is amazing. The shots are amazing. The character development is amazing. The script is amazing i want to tell you i want to say off my own breath that there was this one bit that i didn't like and it made the rest of the film shit like i do with some really bad movies i don't know what it is maybe you can tell me but for me if i ever want to watch a western again i'll look at sergio leone's collection and go hmm how long have i got <laughs> <laughs> oh hell yeah <laughs> I'm giving Once Upon a Time in the West my highest rating of must watch. This is a masterpiece, a classic. It's one of the best westerns ever made and one of the best damn films ever made. It's nearly flawless in its execution. It's damn near perfect in every department from cinematography, pacing, editing, music, performances, script writing, and the film is still entertaining now as it's ever been. It's absolutely genius how well-crafted this is. Ennio Morricone's score is fantastic. It's layered so well. Each prominent character with identifiable themes uh, that sets the mood and the scene uh, and the way the film is edited to punctuate the score, perfection. The casting was outstanding, with Henry Fonda delivering one of the most chilling and cold villains in cinema, while Jason Robards as Cheyenne remains my favourite character as the outlaw with a heart. It's a slow burn, for sure, but it builds tension and suspense magnificently with one of the best final showdowns put on film. 
The set design, the costumes, the lighting, sound effects are all also worth mentioning as being equally masterfully done. It's a story of revenge, of greed and lust, with captivating characters made by legends of the film industry. This is a must-watch film. Watch it. Rewatch it. It's frickin' epic. <laughs> there were three men in her life. One knew her past, one wanted her land, and one wanted revenge. Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. <laughs>